The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. Jesus has been betrayed, arrested, tried, convicted, flogged, beaten, mocked, spat upon, crowned with thorns, and sentenced to crucifixion. Then in Matthew 27, 3-4, we find the following. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. See to it yourself. Now there's more to this story, things that I'll cover in another lesson, but today I want to focus on these two verses of Matthew 27. You all know the backstory. You know how it is that in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, it says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And you know that Judas found that opportunity and exploited it, resulting in the arrest of Jesus and all that followed. Now, after having seen the consequences of his actions, Judas is filled with remorse. And with a heart of repentance, he returns to the chief priests seeking a remedy for the sin guilt he has incurred. And how do they respond to his plea? They say, what is that to us? See to it yourself. In J.B. Phillips, their reply is translated, And what has that got to do with us? That's your affair. In the ICB, what is that to us? That's your problem, not ours. The GNT, what do we care about that? That is your business. The ISV, what do we care? Attend to that yourself. The ERV, we don't care. That's a problem for you, not us. The MEV, what is that to us? You must see to that. And Mounts reads, what is that to us? It is your responsibility. But the full scope of the impact of their response is perhaps best captured by the voice, which renders the answer the chief priests and the elders gave to Judas, we're through with you, friend. The state of your soul is really none of our affair. Now, in my lesson over the last ten weeks or so, I know that I have painted a pretty damning picture of the leaders of occupied Israel in first century Palestine, particularly in regard to their involvement in the arrest, trial, and conviction of Christ. Which picture I think is true to the portrait painted for us by Scripture, because the Bible offers us very little in the way of anything that might give us a fuller, more balanced, more well-rounded view of the men involved in the conspiracy against Christ. No, the only information the Bible gives us on these men is that which is relevant to redemptive history. But the details that it does relay to us about the high priests and their colleagues is unmistakably reprobative. However, no record of the behavior of the chief priest is more damning than the report given to us in the first few verses of Matthew 27, where they are said to have turned Judas away when he came to them seeking relief from his burden of guilt. Because even though, as I pointed out in lessons number 349 and 350, jurisprudence and the architect of the crucifixion, Caiaphas, is a political appointee, he is still a priest. And not just any priest, but the high priest. And not just on the ground. Not just by earthly standards, but by heavenly standards as well. After all, according to the testimony of the disciple Jesus loved, in John 11, 50-51, when Caiaphas said to his fellow priests, You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own. But as high priest that year, his words were words of prophecy. Caiaphas is a priest in the eyes of God. And all of his colleagues on the high council, all the other high priests, are priests as well. And as priests, it is their sacred duty to represent God to the flock and their flock to God. Not just the flock at all, but every sheep in the fold, individually. Individually. 
That is central to the office of priest. In Exodus 7, 1 through 2, the Lord appointed Moses to be Pharaoh's priest, telling him, Behold, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Now, Pharaoh never accepted the priesthood of Moses, but don't miss the point. The chief duty of a priest is to represent God to his people and his people to God. That's why, for instance, up until Vatican II, priests in the Roman Catholic Church always conducted their services facing the tabernacle with their backs to the congregation. Because, as they understand the matter, Christ is present in the church most palpably and most importantly in the sanctified host, which is reserved in a vault called the tabernacle at the front of the nave behind the altar. So, as priests, they face God as the representative of the congregation. And when they administer the sacraments, they stand as the representative of God to their congregants. Now, in Protestant churches, we have historically viewed the primary role of the minister not as a priest, but as a prophet. That's why in our services, the minister always faces the congregation, speaking as a prophet, forth-telling the word of God. And in Protestant traditions, the human role of priest has been taken out of the soul hands of the clergy and placed in the hands of the body. And this is something with which you're all familiar because in our tradition, we have always taught and held to the priesthood of all believers. And that brings us to what I want to talk about this morning. Under the covenant of Moses, God appointed the Levites to serve in the role of priests for his people. And that means something. Under the new covenant, Paul tells us in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But under the Old Covenant, it was the duty of the priests, working together with the faithful of Israel, to work out the salvation of the people, both as a people and as individuals. Because the priests were the shepherds. They were the gatekeepers who administered the blessings of the covenant to the people and who negotiated every transaction of sin and trespass between fellow citizens of the nation and between individual citizens and God. If anyone living under the covenant of Moses sinned, their only recourse for forgiveness, their only recourse for absolution was through a priest. That's why, as I understand the matter, Judas turned to Caiaphas and his compatriots when he realized the gravity of his sin and wanted to repent of it. He didn't come to them just because they were his handlers in this grand sting operation, but also, and more importantly for the purposes of today's lesson, because they were his priests. He had sinned, and he knew he had sinned, and he wanted his sin to be forgiven. And Jesus wasn't yet available to serve as his priest, so he turned to the men that God had appointed for that very purpose under the covenant to which he was bound, and they turned him away. Because these priests weren't just corrupt, they were derelict. Judas came to them, asking them to do what God had appointed them to do, and their response was, it's not our problem. It's your problem. You deal with your guilt and remorse yourself. Well, Judas took their advice. He dealt with his guilt and pain himself, resorting to the best remedy he could think of, and we all know how that turned out. Now, as far as the priests are concerned, this is a closed matter. They did what they did, and it's up to them to give an accounting for their own actions. But the question of what the priests of God ought to have done, or might have done, in regard to this remorseful brother seeking forgiveness is as relevant today as it was on Friday, April 3, 33 AD. Because the office and the responsibility of priesthood did not end with the covenant of Moses. No. Jesus superseded the sons of Levi in the office of high priest after the order of Melchizedek, as we read in Hebrews 7, starting in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham apportioned to him a tenth of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but like unto the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. 
Then skipping to verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Christ is our high priest, but he does not fulfill the duties of that office all by himself. No, according to the Bible, he deputized the apostles to serve as priests along with him. John 20, 19 through 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. But wait, there's more. Because the apostles in turn deputized us. Every one of us, every believer, every Christian, every member of the body of Christ to serve in this priesthood as well. 1 Peter 2.5 Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And again in 1 Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Beloved, we are all, every one of us, priests, serving the body of Christ in the priesthood of believers. And that priesthood comes with awesome privileges and awesome responsibilities. Now, we're pretty familiar with the privileges, because it is with the privileges of priesthood in view that we tout the priesthood of all believers. And this, if you were raised in the Church of Christ, you've heard all your life. We don't elevate our ministers to the position of priest because we're all priests. We don't need priests to pray for us. We all have access to God in prayer. We don't need priests to administer sacraments to us, because the table of the Lord is open to all who believe aright. We don't need priests to perform rites of expiation for us. Christ is our high priest, and we all receive forgiveness of our sins directly from Christ. And every word of that is true, but it isn't the whole truth. Because when each of us was ordained as a priest of Christ, when each of us heard, believed, repented, confessed, received baptism, and began walking in newness of life, and so became part of his body, which the Bible refers to as a nation of priests, a royal priesthood, that ordination conferred upon every one of us more than merely the privileges of priesthood, but the responsibilities of priesthood as well. Our privilege is that of having immediate access to God through Christ, but our ordinations as priests confers upon us the responsibilities of the priesthood of Christ. That is, the responsibilities of serving one another and ministering to one another in the capacity of priests. And make no mistake about it, you can't have one without the other. Yes, as priests of Christ, we have unfettered access to the Father through prayer in that we, through Christ, are enabled. We are empowered to bring our prayers directly to the Father through the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us, making our prayers known to the Father in groans that are too deep for words. But we are also charged in the Word of God to pray for one another, that is, to intercede for one another, to serve one another in the office of priest, making supplication one for another. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 14 through 18, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with you, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit 
being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Likewise, yes, as priests of Christ, we are, every one of us, able to bless and partake of the Lord's Supper and to approach the table of the Lord in our own right as sanctified children of God. That is, we don't receive the Lord's Supper as a sacrament of the church in that it is not handed down to us by officers of the church as a top-down impartation that we have to have the permission of men to receive. It is the right of every Christian which right is not mediated by a human priest. But the clear context in which we are to partake of the Lord's Supper is in the gathered community. That is, optimally, we are not to partake of it on our own. We are to partake of it as a body, as the gathered body of Christ. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11:33, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And why does he give this command? Well, it isn't just because the Corinthians were behaving badly, making an overindulgent and culturally divisive feast out of the Lord's Supper. What Paul says as he introduces this thread on the Lord's Supper in verses 23 and 24 of 1 Corinthians 11 is, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had gracified it, he broke it and said, Take Eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What Paul received from the Lord and delivered to the Corinthians was more than merely the story of what happened at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, the Lord took the elements of bread and wine and sanctified them by imbuing them with grace. He eucharisteoed them. He gracified them filling them with his own life substance, which is what grace is, the power and presence of Christ at work within us. And then he administered that grace to all those who were with him in the upper room, giving it to them to eat and drink. And that's what Paul delivered to the Corinthians. Not just a rite, not just a form, not just a symbolic meal given to us as a mnemonic device to help us remember Christ a rite. No, what Paul delivers to the Corinthians, and through the word, what he delivers to us, is a means by which we might impart the life of Christ to one another, by administering grace to one another through mutual participation in the Lord's Supper. That is, every Sunday morning, as you sit quietly and partake of the body and blood of the Lord, and then pass the same to the person next to you, you are acting as a priest, administering a sacrament to your fellow priest. Now, if you want to hear more about that, I invite you to go online and listen to lessons number 100 through 108 in this series. The point for today's lesson is simply this. As a royal priesthood, as a nation of priests, when we share the Lord's Supper with one another, we are doing more than simply remembering Christ. We are administering grace one to another through the elements of the Eucharist, through the bread and the wine, so consecrated and so living into the priesthood of believers. Likewise, yes, it is as individuals that each of us approaches the throne of Christ to receive the forgiveness of our sins from him. Each of us must hear the word for ourselves. Each of us must internalize that word and believe it. That is, to take action based on belief sustained by confidence in the word. Each of us must repent of our own sins. Each of us must make our own confession of faith and each of us must be baptized in order to receive the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and with the Spirit, grace, that we might be enabled to walk in newness of life. As Paul says in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And as is clearly taught to us in Philippians 4, 3, and in seven places in the book of Revelation, our names, our individual names, are recorded one by one in the book of life. So clearly our salvation and the forgiveness of our sins is an individual matter, a matter of individual accountability. And it is as individuals that we petition Christ for grace to expiate our sins, and it is as individuals that we receive grace. But just as clearly 
we are called as priests of Christ to minister grace one to another. As Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4.10, And since every one of you has received the gift of grace, even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And that doesn't just mean that we're supposed to be nice to one another. It means that that which we have received from the Lord, we are to deliver one to another. That just as God, through Christ, has ministered grace to us, we, through Christ, are to minister grace to each other. And one of the ways in which we're to live into this stewardship is by forgiving one another's sins. That is, as the priesthood of believers, as a nation of priests, as a royal priesthood, we have been given the awesome privilege and responsibility of forgiving one another's sins. Now, the example that Peter gives in this passage of that comes a couple of verses before this in 1 Peter 4.8, where Peter tells us that we are to love one another in such a way so as to cover one another's sins. However, there are other places in Scripture where we are charged to forgive one another's sins in language that is much more explicit. In James 5, 13 through 16, we read the following. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Beloved, that's the priesthood of believers in action. We are to confess our sins one to another and we are to forgive one another. We are to serve as priests for one another. We are to confess our sins to one another and we are to receive confession from one another. And when we receive confession from one another, we are to secure healing. We are to secure forgiveness. We are to secure the remission of those confessed sins on behalf of one another. Now, every time I teach on this, I find that there are people in my listening audience who are taken completely off guard with this teaching. One of the objections I hear whenever I bring this up is that surely The confession of sins and the forgiveness imparted in James 5 is limited to personal trespasses. That is, surely I can forgive someone for trespassing against me, but just as surely I am not called, empowered, or authorized to forgive somebody else's sins in general. Well, don't be too sure. Because the testimony of Scripture is that as priests of Christ, we are called, empowered, and authorized to do that very thing. And this only makes sense, really. I mean, we all know the scripture calls us to hold one another accountable for sin because we are commanded over and over in scripture not to allow one another to walk in darkness unchallenged. So when we see a brother or sister fall into sin, we're charged with the responsibility to speak the truth in love and to take that brother or sister to task in regard to that sin. In Matthew 7, 3 through 5, Jesus says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, Many people have taken that to mean that there is no place in Christianity whatsoever for dealing with sin in the lives of others, ever. That is, that it's simply wrong-headed for any Christian to have anything to say whatsoever about the sins of other Christians. But that isn't what Jesus said in Matthew 7. What Jesus did in Matthew 7 was to set forth a priority for dealing with sin among the brethren. The first step, he says, is to get the lumber out of your own eyes. Well, once your own eyes are dendroid free, then it's incumbent upon you to help your brother with the splinter in his eye. Jesus never advocates that Christians ought to be mutually indifferent toward one another's timber-laden eyes. No, he says just the opposite. 
that we should be concerned for the splinters in one another's eyes, and that we ought to do what we can do to help one another with those splinters, even when rendering that aid exposes our own need for ocular deforestation. <laughs> That's why, for instance, in John 8, 1 through 11, in the episode with the woman caught in adultery, the Lord tells the scribes and Pharisees, you need to repent of administering justice without mercy. And he tells the woman, go and sin no more. But that isn't all he says. He goes on in the next verse to say, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life which is reminiscent of what John tells us in 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Because, you see, John understood that one of the functions of the church is to serve as the environment within which we are cleansed of our sins. As we're told in Hebrews 10, 23 through 27, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. One of the purposes for which we assemble ourselves together is to keep one another from wavering and to prompt one another to keep the whole law of God through love and good works with the specific aim in mind that as we see the day approaching, we should do all we can do to prevent one another from falling into sin. And one of the things that we are called to do as priests of Christ to keep one another from falling into sin is to forgive one another's sins. Now, even as I say that, I can already see the wheels turning. And I can see the objections rising in your minds. I mean, yes, of course, everyone agrees that it's our Christian duty to forgive one another of trespasses against ourselves. So, if someone commits a trespass against you, you need to forgive them of it. But you know that I know that you all already know that. So you may suspect that I am saying something more. You may suspect that what I'm getting at this morning is that beyond forgiving personal trespasses, we are called as a priesthood of believers to forgive one another's sins in general. But surely, some of you are thinking that can't be what I have in mind. Because to forgive in the sense of remitting sin is the Lord's to do, and his alone. Well, again, don't be so sure. Yes, Christ alone has the power to forgive sin, and I'm not suggesting that any of us has that power as our native possession. What I am suggesting, however, is that when Christ imputed his righteousness to us, he also imputed to us his power to forgive sins. Now, if you want to hear more about that, you'll have to come back next week. Today, let me just end by saying this. When Judas asked his priests for a remedy to the sin guilt that was weighing on him, they demurred. They told him that his sin was his problem. But, beloved, they were his priests. And they had a responsibility as Judas' priests to minister the sacraments of forgiveness to him. And they shirked that responsibility. But what if they hadn't? What if they had stepped up to the plate and done their priestly duty? What might that have meant for them? What might it have meant for Judas? And what might that mean for us? Come back next week and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30.
We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.